Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sports Deli. We're so grateful that you're joining us today and sharing space with us. We hope you enjoy your experience. And in the Sports Deli, we believe that less is more. Less stands for leadership, equality, empowerment, education, empathy, sports, social injustice, suicide and suicide prevention, and solutions. We talk a lot about white privilege. We believe this is a white problem that's going on in this country. We love to listen and learn. We want to educate, help mobilize, pay it forward, and help change the narrative in this country once and for all. With each episode, thoughtful conversations and insightful guests are always tops on the menu. The Sports Deli is sponsored by Sport RX, the leader in sport prescription eyewear. Give them a buzz at 888-831-5817 and let them know the Sports Deli sent you for your 10% discount. Or if you order online, you can go to sportrx.com and enter the code DELI10. That's D-E-L-I-1-0. If you have any questions, you can email them at info at sportrx.com or there's a live chat feature online and you can talk with a live optician. And what separates SportRx from all the other companies out there, not only do they have live opticians that you're going to be speaking with, their knowledge about your specific needs is hands down second to none. Whether you're a, a, a regular golfer, you're a hack, or you're a pro golfer, you know, whether you're playing uh, high school or college uh, football or you're a professional athlete, uh, you're out walking with your kid and your dogs, Whatever your needs are for men, women, or kids, uh, they will take care of you. So again, give them a call at 888-831-5817 or go online at sportrx.com. If you want to send us an email, you can always do so to thesportsdeli at gmail.com and you can DM us on Instagram at Mike Hootner and on Twitter at Michael Hootner. So grab your favorite deli sandwich or bagel and your favorite beverage and let's do this together in the Sports Deli. If this is your first trip into the Sports Deli, we encourage you to listen to the next 10 minutes as we will chronicle the co-host, Dr. J and myself, Hooty Hoot, with an introduction uh, in terms of our background and who we are and why we started this whole thing. And if you're a returner, feel free to fast forward to the 14 minute and 15 second mark and we will continue with today's Sports Deli podcast. Dr. J hails to us from Maryland. He currently resides in upstate New York. He's a proud graduate of Bethesda Chevy Chase High School in Maryland. He's a sports junkie and sports fanatic by his own admission. He loves his Washington teams, the Wizards, the Washington football team, the Nationals and Capitals. I remember in college, he used to brag all the time about how the Washington football team had a 41-year waiting list. And maybe they're back on track after reaching the playoffs this year in 2020. He loves politics and is definitely the reason I became interested in politics because he's just as passionate and fanatical about politics as he is about sports, probably largely uh, as a result of his parents' um, influence on him. His dad was a lawyer and his mom worked for the government uh, her entire life and uh, I just loved learning from him because I didn't really know much about it uh, before I got to Goucher. And so I have John to thank for um, why I'm so interested and in, in passionate about politics, especially since my college days. He's working on his EDD in higher administration. He's got a master's degree from the University of South Carolina. As a freshman at the University of Kentucky, he won third place in a Rick Pitino lookalike contest. He can recognize the face of just about any athlete, and he has been photographed with the likes of Dick Vitale, Jimmy V, Rick Pitino, Jerry Tarkanian, and Steve Spurrier. Oh yeah, and of course, yours truly several times, Mike Hootner, Hootie Hoot, your co-host here in the Sports Deli. He loves golf, even though he thinks he's better than he is, but he is willing to play any course in the world. He is fearless in that way. Just let him know the time and place, and he will be there. He's played in Scotland, Mexico, Spain, the United States, and other countries, and he's played the Old Course, Torrey Pines, the Ocean Course, 
Pebble Beach, and Doral. And as for myself, Hootie Hoot, I hail to you from Detroit, Michigan. I'm a proud graduate of Oak Park High School. I love my sports teams, the Pistons, the Lions, the Red Wings, and the Detroit Tigers. I had amazing friends growing up uh, on Leslie Street there in Oak Park. I played five sports in high school, uh, including baseball and tennis, basketball, cross country, and soccer. And a, a quick blurb about my, my high school experience. Uh, you know, I went from a private school to a public school in fifth grade, and that's when I really started to uh, feel like I was able to come out of my shell and really be comfortable in my own skin. And uh, mad props to everybody that was a part of my life in Oak Park for the first 18 years from Pepper. Another unbelievable influence in my life was when I played youth sports and Mr. Emanuel, who I'm still friends with today, uh, just loved us. He was an African-American coach. I never felt like he was treating me any differently. And, um, you know, I had a tough time growing up for a number of reasons. And uh, he was always there. He was always tough. He always demanded that we you know, just work hard and gave everyone a fair shot to, you know, play uh, in our basketball games. And um, it's always fun to go back and visit Mr. Emanuel and uh, his son, who's uh, still a good friend of mine after uh, all these years, Dave, to Roosevelt, to uh, high school, uh, from Mr. Sternberg and middle school in particular. He was tough, but he was tough on everyone. You know, Mr. Golding, my seventh grade history teacher, who has been an advocate my entire life and a, and a wonderful support system for me, to all my friends and acquaintances uh, uh, in that Oak Park school system. You know, I know it wasn't easy for a lot of people, but, you know, during those years between fifth grade and twelfth grade, uh, that's when I felt most comfortable uh, being who I was, and I really came out of my shell, and uh, I just I just love my my experience. The other thing I want to mention as far as sports goes, you know, I played junior varsity um, uh, as a junior for both baseball and basketball, which, you know, I got a lot of flack for it um, because people, you know, were like, why would you even waste your time? And, you know, I, I just wanted to play. I didn't care if I was on varsity or junior varsity. I, I just wanted a shot. And uh, I appreciated uh, the opportunity uh, to play junior varsity baseball and basketball as a junior. And then I, I ended up making the varsity both uh, for the baseball and, and basketball teams as a senior. And, uh, you know, that, that helped me to, you know, continue my dream to play college, college basketball. So um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that I got cut three times. And when I talk to kids, um, I always mention this because uh, a lot of times you can learn more about yourself from loss and from getting cut uh, and trying to prove a coach wrong than you can from being given a handout or simply making a team because you know someone or because you're tall or what, whatever. Uh, and I got cut in, in, uh, in middle school. I got cut in high school as a sophomore. And I got cut in college my first year. And every time... The year after that, because I was so motivated and I had a why, and that why was whether I was too white, I was the only white guy on the varsity team in high school on my basketball team, or people said I was too short at 5'7", or whatever the case may, may be. But I had a why. You know, My dad committed suicide when I was nine years old. Uh, I had a lot of reasons to be upset and, and find intrinsic motivation uh, to prove everybody wrong and say F the world. So for those of you out there that are listening that maybe have gotten cut, you know, maybe have had bad experiences or some really bad things happen to you, um, just know that there's a lot of people out there just like you that have gone through hardships and uh, uh, you know, had to, to battle adversity uh, during their lifetime. And you know, that's truly what's going to be a test of your character is if you can get through those things because if you're not a part of the solution, you're a part of the problem. I graduated in 1987 and made my way west where I attended San Diego Mesa College where I played 
uh, college basketball for two years for the Hall of Fame coach James Mulvihall. I learned to play tennis uh, at a higher level from the legendary professor at San Diego Mesa, uh, Dr. Reeves, who really helped me with my backhand in particular and creating more spin uh, on my uh, forehand. And as a result of that, when I transferred to Goucher College and played on the first team in the history of the men's basketball team there in 1990, I also, as a senior, played uh, intercollegiate tennis. I played five singles and uh, two doubles and was all uh, conference in doubles uh, with my uh, doubles partner, Scott. And uh, from there, I went to start my college coaching career. I I got my master's degree from Frostburg State University. I coached for an amazing coach who I learned a tremendous amount from, not only on the court, but off the court, uh, from Oscar Lewis. Um, and uh, I have a beautiful daughter, uh, Amelia. I'm a life coach. I also uh, privately coach golf and tennis. I do a lot of private professional skills training in the sport of basketball. I've sent players overseas. Um, I coach men for 15 years and I'm on my 14th year on the women's side, um, both at the collegiate level and I currently coach at a low income first generation high school, the Proy School in La Jolla, California for girls basketball. Um, unlike John, I've never been married and, uh, I've also been a college professor since 1992. And finally, um, wanted to give a big shout out to the person that's been there uh, through all of my trials and tribulations and my ups and my downs and my successes and who's been an amazing uh, rock to uh, her mom and my grandmother who's been living with us for the past few months during this pandemic, who lost her husband of 71 years recently and... Uh, a testament to uh, the fact that uh, family always comes first and uh, her uh, continuous and endless uh, love and support means the world to all of us, uh, to me, to her granddaughter, Amelia, to her Pittsburgh family, um, to her sisters who she speaks to with several times every day, to all her clients. She's been a psychotherapist for over 40 years and um, just uh, an incredible example of compassion and strength and courage and and wisdom so I know I speak for dr. J that when we first started this endeavor it was really to talk sports and it's turned into much more than that and if you haven't uh, listened to any of our previous podcasts we encourage you to do so we've had some unbelievable guests uh, civil rights activists, WNBA players, NBA players, Division I coaches. We've had the former president of the NCAA on the podcast. We've had former Super Bowl MVP Doug Williams on the podcast. We've had special dedications to uh, Breonna Taylor and the Black Lives Matter movement. We've had Jay Billis and Seth Greenberg from ESPN, former UCLA head coach Steve Lavin. Chris Moore, the CEO of the Positive Coaching Alliance. Kevin Eastman, former NBA coach. Just a, a phenomenal list of who's who in the world of sports. So thanks again for joining Dr. J and myself, Hootie Hoot. And just wanted to give you a little bit of uh, background about who we are. So check us out on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or iHeartRadio. And uh, if you have any questions... Uh, as always, you can always send us an email or DM us. Now back to the sports deli. Dad, we're already recording from out the gate? Really? <laughs> Y'all are but, some funny motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you look like, that looks like, like, uh, like a, that background, it looks like you're in uh, the NFL headquarters or something. That's like I big, should be. You should be. I agree. That's big time yeah, right there. Be. You look great. I make a lot of positive changes. Yes, you would. That will make fans happier, players happier. Good. And that's all we give a about. So let's go. <laughs> I, I agree. Uh, just real quick, uh, 
John, Dr. J, he's uh, he's in a PhD program. Excuse me, somebody's doing <laughs> a PhD program. You know. All right, I just like football. Excuse me, <laughs> whatever. We're going to talk about the Jets and and whatever else we're going to talk about. The J E T S oh. Jets Jets Jets. I've lived in New York, but I grew up a Washington football fan. That's oh yeah. Okay, look. Okay, John, I'll let you slide. All right, this go. guy right here with this dope ass bandana on or whatever the f he's wearing. I'll let this slide. All right, because the people looking out for you. Well, you know, when we were in college and when I met John, he he went to Kentucky first, and he always used to brag to me that the Washington at the time the Redskins had a forty-one year waiting list. You can't give those tickets away now. Well, maybe now you'll be able to, but <laughs> no. The no. Jets tickets are free right now. So what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. The Jets they actually pay you to come to a wear. game. <laughs> the Jets pay you to come. For the Jets. I'm not wearing anything Jets right now. <laughs> exactly. Oh man. So who who were you who were you with today? Who'd you spend time with today? Anybody who fun? Didn't I? Oh god. Who didn't I spend time? Yeah, I'm 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 kind of on overload. So I'm like, I, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of. I'm kind of like tinkering out. And I know me when I start to tinker out, it's going to be crazy because I'm going to get my <laughs> energy back. So second, let's go. Your second one. You know, when, we, when, I, when we decided on this day, I did not put two and two together that it was the day before the Super Bowl. And I just realized when I was talking to John, I was like, man, she must have been like blowing up today, day before with everything going on, especially with the women. Well. Well, most coach jet, most Jets coaches are usually available the day before the Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, I, you know what? You're so lucky you're not anywhere near me right now. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> but I'd have to agree. I mean, it, it's unfortunate. It, 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 those are facts. Those are facts. Stephen A. Smith is my alter ego. I'm the female version of Stephen A. Smith. Yes. So, okay. so I, I, I respect that. But come on, man. Go, go, somebody, <clears throat> go somewhere else with that shit. <laughs> John, she's roasting your ass right from the jump. We ain't done the intro yet. <laughs> what the f oh shit. Right, so have you ever uh spoken with Stephen A? I have not, but he and I so need to. Oh god. He's he and I so need to. I'm gonna be doing a show, a sports show called Bet on Black Sports. Bet on black sports, because most most uh players especially in the NFL, are black men, right? So yeah. come on, bet on black sports. Let's talk about this. You know, I want to talk about coverages, defensive, offensive, uh, but, you know, more importantly, it's just sports. I got to say, right? that, that background is the best background I've seen of all our guests. I love that. Well, if you knew where I lived, I live in Forest Hills, in Forest Hills, Queens. So I can, I usually walk to the U.S. Open, Nice. Uh, across the oh, highway, yeah, you under the footbridge. <laughs> um, so, so what happens is the building where I live, I can hear everybody in the building. I live on the tenth floor, and sometimes when I'm in my apartment, I can hear people in the hallway, you know, waiting for the elevator or taking the garbage out. And I'm like, she's leaving her husband. He cheated on her with two strippers. <laughs> the fuck, you know, and. And then it made me think, and I was like, oh, wait a minute. That means they hear me. Oh, sh So this <laughs> behind me, this is a uh, soundboard. So oh, this I is leather you. soundboard. If I was Tyler Perry and I had a lot of money, <laughs> I would have my own you know, movie theater in my home. Oh, hell yeah. So I have this, only so these ass don't hear my ass so shit, right? So, <laughs> like John, a modern can you get day that? Seven. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious john you need to do something with your background because you, that map you got is, <laughs> is sorry as hell i've been trying to tell him that shit. he's like oh i'm renting so you need to get something back there besides that old ass map you got put my helmet up there you go why that one? Oh wow really <laughs> you're gonna put that one up instead of the jets i'll find a jets jesus christ i'm gonna start wow. the intro that's brutal. You and your fake goddamn countertop there. Come on, man. Right? This show's not about you. It's about Colette. What the hell? No, it's about all of us. I like your background, by the way, though. Oh, what well, don't this... you have up there? 
I mean, it's just, that's, that's all me and obviously social injustice stuff, but uh, my lion stuff, magic came from Michigan state, Larry, nice. The original step back. Um, I had a autograph, uh, Joe Namath. I don't even, I, I, oh, I remember. Oh, Joe, Joe was talking about me and I found out. And oh, I had to damn. call his white ass out on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love Joe Namath though, but I'm like, Joe, don't, don't sleep now, you know? <laughs> Time to go do another commercial for the for pantyhose and, and, and goddamn insurance <laughs> and AARP. reverse mortgage. Do reverse, a reverse mortgage. Right. Reverse I'm sure mortgage. that's legit. Right, reverse mortgage. So you, when your grandma dies, the house goes to the government. Get the hell out exactly. of here! Exactly. Come yeah. on, man. <laughs> there it is. All right, let's get rocking and rolling here. We are joined by Colette Smith, who hails to us from New York who loved the New York Jets growing up. When she turned 18, she moved from New York City to Alabama to attend Tuskegee University. She's always loved football as she would watch it with her dad and brother growing up. For years, she didn't feel valuable, worthy, and didn't understand what love really meant. And as a result of her experiences growing up, has been on a journey to empower young girls and women so that they always understand that they are valuable, worthy, and loved. Although she smoked and did drugs for years, she's an inspiration for so many reasons to women, especially black and brown women and girls, recovering drug addicts, suicide survivors, domestic abuse and rape survivors, women's football players and coaches. She's an ambassador for the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. She's a true believer in giving back to her community as she was a mentor with Alan Houston of the New York Nick Entrepreneurial Program for Urban Youth. She's also an ambassador up U.S. Sports and the Voss Foundation is dedicated to funding access to clean water, sanitation, and hygiene as a means to enable community-driven development in sub-Saharan Africa and raising awareness of the ongoing need in the region. She emphasizes the importance of building positive self-esteem through team sports to at-risk teens. She believes in empowering girls and giving them tools to succeed in life both on and off the field. And her mission is to have a positive impact on the development of young girls who will become the strong, effective leaders of tomorrow. She's a mentor, a motivational speaker. She's been a commencement speaker. She shares a birthday with Trot Nixon, Mark Teixeira, and NFL quarterback, Terry Cousin. And as much as she wanted to play Pop Warner football like her brother, she was told that she couldn't because she was a girl and had to settle for street football instead with her and her brother's friends. She dropped out of college and worked for Swatch, did construction and was in real estate. And when she saw an ad for the New York Sharks, New York's only pro female women's football team at the time, she tried out at the age of 42. After the tryout, other women were thanking her for her passion and work ethic, and that changed the course of her life forever. She was the first African-American NFL female coach, first New York Jets female coach, and the third ever female coach in the NFL She's the founder of Believe in You Incorporated. It's a company near and dear to her heart as she visits public schools in low income and underserved communities, colleges, universities, corporations, organizations, and events to tell her story of hard knocks and triumphs to instill in kids and women to believe in themselves, dream big, go the distance, and to never give up in pursuing their dreams. She believes in taking on everything she encounters seriously, passionately. You find Believe in You In is the letter N. Believe in You online at believeinyouinc.com. You can find her on Instagram at Colette V. Smith. Hey, welcome to the Sports Daily. We're honored to have you for real. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Let's go. I love it. it. So there, there's so many inspiring things to share with our listeners. You know, it's... Um, it's what you've been through personally, I know you've shared the story before, but a lot of our listeners are white as we, you know, like to further this conversation. Mm-hmm. Sports fans, obviously. Uh, so we like to have a, you know, a good balance of fun and, and talk about real issues that maybe can educate and get people to change how they see the world about women, about African Americans, bra- black and brown people, yeah. right? And, and uh, yeah. white privilege. So um you're so you're always as people will, will will hear today. You're so passionate about you know everything that you do and you're a part of. So you after the tryout, you know you you made the team. You started eating better. You started thinking differently. Yeah. You started working out. You you distanced yourself from people that were toxic, you know, and cancerous for you. 
Yeah. And, you, and you need to be around like-minded people. So talk about how that changed your life. So, I mean, uh, for, for, for me, I, I think that, I, I think what, what I can say football saved my life, right? So football saved my life. And when I think about that, that just means so many different things to me when it, when it, when it comes to being a black girl in America, being a black girl in, in New York, um, you know, not having the same rights as everybody else, whether it be the rights because I wasn't, a, I wasn't white or the rights that I wasn't a boy. So football came into my life as a winner, which gave me a winning attitude to say anything is possible. And so um, I'm just forever grateful to football. I've been a football fan my entire life. Hmm. I mean, when, when, I talk, when I think about waking up on Sunday mornings with my dad watching football, everybody else can <laughs> go to hell. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you're making pancakes. The games are on, let's go. And so my life has been devoted to football, but I've never really had a place or a position in football because I'm a girl. So I'm using, I'm now using what I discovered, making my own path, finding my happiness. I'm using that to give to others. So I am most happy at this point doing what I do with Believe in You Incorporated to empower black youth. That's awesome, John. So, Coach, I'm just curious. As you know, a, your time with the Jets. You know, Todd Bowles, defensive coordinator, yeah. obviously the defensive coordinator with the Buccaneers. Yeah. And you know, I'm I'm an old Washington football fan. He went. He won a Super Bowl with the Washington football team back in the day. Um, talk about your time with Coach Bowles. And are you surprised at this? I'm sure you're not, but I'm going to hear from you of the success he's having. You know, being back with Arians. Um, you know, from that standpoint, and what did you learn from him? So, you know, uh, I, I got to tell you, I, when I, I, I mean, I knew about, of course, I knew about Todd Bowles being the Jets head coach. And then it was, it was a, it was a two win for me. It was a win win because here he was a new quarter, a, a new coach for the Jets. We needed some new, you know, leadership. And then he happened to be a black guy. So as a black girl, I was like, oh, hell yeah. So I got to meet him and he's, he's such a phenomenal man. Like forget about being a coach or a black guy or whatever. He is such a phenomenal person that you just really, he's infectious. His energy is infectious. Funny enough, here's something that people don't know. At, when I was working with the Jets at interviews after practices or when he was interviewing as a head coach, he wouldn't give the reporters anything. He was like boring and stoic. <laughs> and then the minute he left that interview and he came into the, mind you, he came into the defensive coaching meeting room and we were all, all the coaches would be in there, all the linebacker coaches, outside <laughs> linebackers, the DB coaches were all in there. And then he's like, ha, 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 guess what I did today? I didn't give him shit. You know, so <laughs> he's he really, more than what people think, you know, because all these, you know, when you think about football and you think about the fans, right? Fans for any team, any respective team, fans are very shady. So they love you when you're winning. They, they hate you when you're losing, right? They don't think about things from a player perspective or from a coaching perspective or from a GM perspective or money perspective, right? So, so we had fans that would be talking about him like a dog like, oh, he's so corny. Oh, he's he has no energy. If they only knew the energy that he had was <laughs> crazy. So, wow. so Coach Bowles, when I was coaching there, Michael, this is hilarious. I would be on the sideline. Like <laughs> I didn't, I coached DBs, right? So I didn't coach special teams. We always started with special teams at practices. Special teams went first. I used to play special teams. As I'm there during practice, the games, the, the practice is going on and I'm cursing and I'm like, what the fuck, what is going on? Because <laughs> my DBs would be out there, let's say on kickoff. Well, you gotta have ice outside containment, right? So my DBs should be getting DB workouts on special teams, even though they're like, oh, I'm a corner. Oh, I'm a, I'm a safety. But guess what? Get, get your drills in, get your workouts in. So anyway, 
I would be cursing the guys out on the sideline to myself. What the f are you kidding me? And then I would turn around, like I would have my arms crossed and I'd turn around and I would walk, walk right into Coach Bull's chest. And I would be like, oh, I'm so sorry. And he's like, no, what's the problem? And then I was like, did you not to see that? And he's like, well, go change it. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so yeah, there's, there's, there's too many stories. Coach Bowles is an is a exceptional man. I can tell you, when I watch the, the Bucks games and when defense hits the field and he's throwing blitzes and he's doing four or three defenses and he's like, and I'm like, holy s***, this is Todd Bowles all the way <laughs> through and through. So I am not surprised he is in the Super Bowl tomorrow. So I'm excited for him. I'm really pumped for him. That's great. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, so tell everyone how you got, uh, got started. Like when we talked to Jennifer King, right? She, she went through the mentoring program that Sam Rappaport was, was involved with. And, uh, um, but but how, how, did, how did you get your in? Yeah. You're listening to an interview with Colette Smith, former assistant coach with the New York Jets. She was the first African-American woman coach in the NFL. And she's joining us today in the Sports Deli for this powerful, hilarious, incredible interview. Thanks for joining us again today in the Sports Deli. We hope you enjoy the next segment with Colette Smith. So, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have an end like that. I didn't have any support. Um... I didn't have any ends. My my end was me carrying a jackhammer on my back in case I needed it. So for the most part, it was just, I was looking for support for women's football. Right. And, and, and in particular, my team, my New York team. Mm -hmm. So I'm in New York, we're women's pro football. We have two New York pro football teams, meaning the Jets and the Giants. So why is it that neither one of them are supporting us and calling us their sisters? So when I got promoted to be the marketing director, I did promotions, events, and PR. My first duty, my innate duty, was to get on social media to find Jets fans and say, hey, love the Jets. Uh, NFL's over. So if you want football, come watch the women play. So that kind of sparked attention. Mm -hmm. So I was very strategic as you would be as a coach, right? Strategic is strategy. So um, I could take the slowest guy and if I put him in the right position to win, he's gonna f win, right? So, so it was all strategy. So for me, I got to, I got to a, a Jets practice. I had somebody from the front office call me that happened to see me all over social media talking about women's pro football and my love of the Jets, which was very true. And so I got a phone call and I was really in a bad attitude this day because I got a lot of guys that just would call me, hey, uh, see you guys on social media. Do you guys really play football? And I'm like, it's called New York Sharks women's pro football, so yeah. Or I would get a guy saying, do you really use a football or are you on a field? And I'm thinking, so I usually fielded a lot of stupid people contacting me. So I had an attitude. I said, oh, here we go again. And as I had an attitude, it happened to be the vice president of operations for the New York <laughs> Jets. And I was like, whoop, whoop, change attitude real quick. Morph me into somebody else. So that's pretty much how it happened. And the guy and wow. I, his name is Clay Hampton. He and I spoke and he said, Colette, I can feel your energy and your passion and your knowledge of football through the phone. He goes, I'm going to do this for you. And I'm going to do that for you. And I held him to it. I hmm. held him to it. So I made it to practices. So that was kind of how I got into, how I got to be a coach in the NFL. By the way, it was not something I thought about. I wasn't aspiring to be a coach in the NFL. It wasn't on my radar. The only thing on my radar was to give a claim and attention to women playing football that had to pay to play. That's all I wanted was for us to get some support. And in turn, I ended up coaching for the New York Jets. So I'm, you know, as the first black woman to ever do it in NFL history, 
So, um, yeah, Coach Bowles and I were talking shop. And it just, it, it happened. That's amazing. Um, <clears throat> and, and Jen's going to be coming on soon, too. First ever uh, female coach. Yeah. Yep. She's a fireball. Yeah. I can just tell from her messages. She, <laughs> she is fired up, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so we're excited to have her on, too. Let me ask you this. What, why is there not the WNFL, like the WNBA? Yeah, I mean, I, I think about, I've thought about that for about 10 years now, at least. You know, um, I, I can't answer that question. The, the people I speak to at the NFL headquarters will tell me, you know what? It's about dollar signs. Dollar signs. We don't see women football generating income or generating money that would give us a reason to follow through with it. So if it's all about money, then we're missing the mark here. Because when I think about sports, as much as I love football, it is about passion. It is not about looking cute. It is not about anything else but playing a sport we love, right? So when you play in a childlike euphoria of just loving the game, then it should be, it's, it's usually infectious. So the same thing would be applicable for women. I mean, I, 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 but I call bullshit on that because the, the, the WNBA, they, they grow $60 million a year. You, you mean to tell me, that, you mean to tell me that the a WNFL wouldn't, wouldn't make that much money. I say that they absolutely would, would, would at least match what the WNBA is doing. Yeah. And the, and, and, the, and the WNBA, in my opinion, is not making as much money as it should be. So the NBA, let's be very clear about this. The <laughs> NBA supports them. Right. They help start the WNBA. Right. But exactly. guess what? It still stops. There's a, there's a cutoff line for yeah. the women of, the, of, of basketball. There's a cutoff line. So they could be making a lot more money. Those women and basketball players are not making enough money, I believe. So... I feel like football, women in football would be a no brainer, no a brainer. no brainer because it's that much more unorthodox. I, any girl, a woman or girl is pushed into basketball before football, right? So now we've got this sport that women love just as much or more than men. So why are we not fostering that? The, 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 to me, the, the, as much as I love the NFL, they're ass they should be doing their own league for women. And I don't know totally. why they're dropping the ball. Yeah. Well, I hope, I hope that uh, it comes to fruition. And I, and I hope you're uh, the commissioner because you would be <laughs> like literally perfect. No, I'm dead serious. You would be an amazing commissioner. You know, you played, you, you understand the ins and outs of the game. You were in the NFL. Like, honestly, who would be better? You know, why aren't you coaching now? Is that something so you're interested I'm, in? I'm not. I'm not coaching now because I started my own company. So what I, what I discovered was what I did in the NFL uh, empowered so many black girls and brown girls and just all girls and women that I wanted to be hands-on. If anybody knows me, I am a very hands-on person. I want to take the bull by the horn and wrestle him to the ground right now today. I'm not waiting for tomorrow. I'm making tomorrow better today. So I had to start my company to go visit schools. So I make it a point to visit schools before pre-coronavirus. I was visiting three and four schools a day sometimes in low-income neighborhoods and marginalized communities. So I am, I am literally most happy uh, empowering Black youth, both boys and girls, to discover their greatness. And if nobody will believe in you the way no one believed in me outside of my mom and dad, you believe in you. So I am bringing that hope and that empowerment and that encouragement to black children across America. So my company believe in you has, has pretty much fueled my purpose. That's amazing. And you talked about marginalization, uh, which people that are either not in denial or at least trying to get educated or have come a little bit further along with this conversation, understand a little bit better than maybe they did you know, eight or nine months ago. Um, <clears throat> but is there a point before that happens that that people have to look inward or be willing to look inward, um, no matter if they're hurting? You know, you went through a lot of stuff when you were younger uh, from, from a family member that you've been very open about. Yeah. You, know, you can't s skip to level five 
unless you're able to start with level one and, and build yourself up to feel like you're worthy of empowerment. <laughs> right? Yeah, but 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 guess what? What's level one? Please some tell me what level one is to you. Because your level one might be my level four. That's true. Right? So yeah. so I mean. I had a black family that I grew up with. My, my mom and dad, my dad worked his ass off just to feed us. I was right. never hungry, but I never knew until much later on that he was, he was burying himself. You know, he had to work harder. And then as I got to be a young adult or, or a teenager, my father would come home really upset. And he would say, I just had to train two white kids just out of college for a promotion that I should be getting, you know? And I'm like, well, why aren't you getting it, dad? Cause I'm black, you know? So here he was training new hires that were white mm. to get a job that he should rightfully have next in line. And if he sucked, why are they asking him to train them, right? Mm. So it's kind of like, so what is your one? What is your A? So, so there's so many different levels and factors that go into everything where some kids don't know anything else but where they live right now. Right. They don't know anything else but the drug life. They don't know anything else but the ghetto. They don't know anything else but their mom not working or their mom dating 10 different guys that gives her 20 bucks from time to time to feed you. They don't know this. If that's all you see, that is all you know. That's why I come into place. I come in now and I talk about a different reality that they've never seen. Or some may have heard about a different reality, but it seemed foreign. It was like, that was TV. That was Bill Cosby and Claire Huxtable shit, right? So, yeah. so I'm like, no, I'm just like you. I'm just like you. I, I grew up in a project too. Now what? Here's what I did though. So I want to give hope. So I am grateful to have coached in the NFL. Absolutely. To be the first black woman to do it. I am grateful to be the first female to coach in New York Jets franchise history. But I gotta tell you, I am most grateful to help empower and inspire kids that don't know, that don't know anything different than that I'm gonna be stuck here in the same situation like my mom. Yeah. How, how, so is it a matter of funding besides your passion and besides your emotional support? You know, what, what, what uh, extrapolation of believe in you is, is going to come to be able to go in different parts of these inner cities and, and to be able to have them see people like them, not necessarily on street corners, but as artists and as dentists and as lawyers yeah. and as vice presidents of the United States. Right. How are they going to be able to see these things as, as women in the NFL? And, and it's not just, a, oh, well, I'm going to come and speak one time. And, oh, well. Oh, I'm not a one, I'm not right. a one and done girl. girl. Yeah. I'm definitely not a one and done. I don't, I don't even date guys like that, right? So one and done, not <laughs> happening. So I'm, I, you're going to see me more than once, okay? Right. So, so for me, it's usually, so schools in New York City. So I, I have a New York City, I am New York City Department of Education vendored. So that means that when, when, when I tell a principal, I have a vendor number, they're like, oh, you want money? And I'm like, well, yeah, you know, and principals have told me we have money every quarter. If we don't use it, we lose it. Mm. So we would love to give it to you. Mm. So I may only charge a school 500 bucks, $700, mm. whatever they have. Most of the time I go for free. Right. And my father is like, um, Colette, this is great what you're doing, but uh, how good are you going to be when you keep taking jobs on for free and you're homeless? Talking about empowerment, right? right so, so I have been getting paid by major corporations from Amazon to Airbnb mm. to uh, banks, MF, MF, uh, MUFG Bank. So I have companies that are paying me to do corporate thing, deals. So the more money I make at a corporate level, I can now visit more schools because I have more money to do that if the school can't pay me. So you're educating, are you educating these companies also about diversity and, and how Absolutely. Much, what, Absolutely. What, how much pushback do you get? None. 
not from the white people that are like, this is bullshit. None. I mean, come on, Michael. I imagine mean, me, imagine I've, re- me I've read, to- I've read white fragility. I've heard a lot of people that do diversity. What's your, come on, what, what coach, what's your message when you go into the companies? What do you My lead message- with? So, so what do I lead with? I lead what, wake with- Wake the fuck up. <laughs> well, that, easy. that part, that, yep, yeah, that's a part of it. So what I lead with is like, here I am. I've done A, B, C, and D. And I'm a suicide survivor, a rape survivor, a domestic violence survivor. My parents have no money. But here I am doing amazing things. Why would you not foster someone that didn't go to Yale, Brown, or Harvard? You're, you guys are missing the mark because guess what? If we were to think about this from an aspect of, you know when you rescue a dog from a shelter? When you rescue a dog from a shelter, that dog is so grateful to have you, you know, in their life. Like rescue a life, save a life, give somebody hope because it's, guess what? It's going to save you right back. It's going to save you right back. You they have, hire a, they have a different why. They have a different why. No hopes and, right. and no means to go to school. You foster her. And she comes and works for your company because you paid for her tuition. She's going to be dedicated to you. Now, let me let me ask you this because we have a lot of white listeners, right? So so educate people who are listening to this who don't think that um, blacks have it hard anymore, that the opportunities are equal, mm-hmm. that white privilege is bullshit. And um, and I've given this example to a lot of white people that I've spoken to here when they they don't understand it. You take a resume from somebody who's from Yale, who's got a 4.0, who went to all private schools, who's white. You take an African-American who went to Monmouth, not to pick on Mm -hmm. the New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And she's, they have a 2.8 and Mm -hmm. they didn't have the greatest education and they didn't have the greatest uh, internships. That's a form of systemic racism. Absolutely. Because, because they didn't have the same educational opportunities. They might not have had internet. You don't know if they were outside Taco Bell for the four years they were in high school just to get oh, through yeah. high school so they could get yeah. into Mom and Flores. Oh, you know what, though? Because we got to, we, we have to jump through, we got to jump through hurdles. We got to jump 10 more hurdles than you have to. We have to share a room with five other people. We have to do so much more to get where you are at the same level. So please, somebody tell me, I would, I would rather have the person that worked their ass off under unconventional and hard circumstances that still graduated. And I know that if they had an easier road, that means coming home from school, having dinner, having a computer to plug into to do research and homework, Right. And they were able to close their door and get some good rest and have nutrients. That's not the norm for black people in America. There's some that have it and that's great, but it isn't the norm. So you hire a girl or a boy that has a 2.5 GPA from a, a, a community college, exactly. as opposed to a kid that's at Yale with even a 3.0. Guess what? Who's your worker be? Who is going to deliver hard? Who is going to be my best blitzer? Guess what? That kid that had a hard life. That kid that had to run to school so he so he so he didn't get shot. That kid that had to step over crackheads in the street. He's my MVP. So let's wake up. Let's wake up and realize that this is a reality that people want to ignore because it makes you feel better. You can go to sleep at night without having to think about their people still living a hard life. Well, they or they don't think it applies to them or they're they're just not that they're not racist. Right. They're oh, I love black people. I talk to black people. You know, oh, I have a black friend. That, that's I the best. Friend. I got a black friend. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so why during this hiring cycle uh, did more coaches and there's at least 25 or 30 that John and I could name right now that are qualified uh, to be head coaches? Why 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 did the one African-American get the shit? Texans, the guy with the Texans. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, when you think about the owners of NFL franchise teams, these are owners that didn't have to worry about what to eat. They they probably worried about, you know, the shoes. Like, what shoes should I wear? It's a different beast. So their reality is not our reality. 
So I, I think, and this is just my opinion here, it's the good old boys club. It's the good old boys club. And if I'm going to hire a black guy, guess what? He's going to yes me. <laughs> right? So we want, if, if we are going to hire a black guy, he better keep quiet and just do his little job. So, I mean, there's a lot of factors and a lot of reasons. Some I might be right on, some I might be wrong, some I hope I'm wrong on. I hope I'm wrong. I really do. So do you think it, in, yeah. Oh, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. Do you think that uh, Mr. Rooney, who just came out and sort of backpedaled his original comments that said, oh. you know, we're not there yet. And then Roger Goodell just said again uh, that, you know, we need to do a better job, you know, Obviously, he's a he's a puppet on many levels for the. Owners, yeah. So. so 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 Roger. Oh, Roger Goodell. Oh, Roger makes a lot um, of. Money. Yeah. I mean, come on. He makes he makes more than an average football player makes as their first year. Right. Yeah. And he's so, so come on. So it took him a long time. What? 2020. They just came around talking about Black Lives Matter. When although we had Colin Kaepernick taking a knee for, for seeing people that look like him killed by policemen, right? I had to ask my father, who's a military guy. My dad is a 101st Screaming Eagles airborne, Vietnam era. And I said, dad, do you think that what Colin Kaepernick is doing by taking a knee for the national anthem is disrespectful? How do you feel about that? You being a military man. And my dad said, not at all. In fact, America was built on you being able to speak freely. He goes, so no, I hold no, no dissatisfaction with that. So Colin Kaepernick lost his job because of this. This guy, Colin Kaepernick, brought the 49ers to the Super Bowl. Exactly. He was a backup. So now he's no, he's not worthy. Come on, let's talk reality. Let's talk facts. Let's talk eight minutes and 46 seconds, right. okay? Let's talk that. Let's talk about the national anthem has four verses and we don't sing two of them because two of them involve slavery. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yeah. Right. So there's a lot that, that, can, that can change, but I just really believe that the, that, that the NFL franchise owners are out of touch. You know, let them live with me for a week. <laughs> Let them live with a few people that I know in their homes and see how they live. And they would have a whole new change of mind and respect for what people that don't have a silver spoon shoved up their ass live like. So speaking of silver spoons, I've, John has deferred to me on this, but I've been very vocal about um, the face of the league, which is still Tom, you know, the goat. Ah! And so... Um, and I had another discussion with one of our other co-hosts, uh, uh, coach K and, you know, he said, conservatives just don't speak on this kind of stuff. And I was like, look, man, it, it as much as I'm a Michigan guy and, and I love, you know, prior to May 26th, like I, I just, I cannot with that platform for the life of me, I don't care how much he's helped Antonio Brown. I don't care what he's uh, doing in the locker room. Like, I, I just don't, this isn't even like the criticism that Michael Jordan got uh, yeah. at, at the current time that we're living in with this racial reckoning, with the amount of white people that have, have come forward and, and been a collective voice with this. It's inexcusable to me that, that Tom Brady has not spoken out and said Black Lives Matter. He hasn't said one, one word, not one word about it. Not I don't care if he voted for Trump and he loves him and he's a friend and he's loyal. Yeah. I think it is, is inexcusable. And that should be as big a part of his legacy as anything else that he was not I outspoken agree. just as much as Steph Curry, who wants to be uh, remembered for more than being the best shooter that ever lived. That he is, he of all people doesn't necessarily need to do what he's doing. Go on race and sports on the golf channel, interview Obama, yeah. have a book club. Like yeah. he's, he is so far going beyond what he right. even needs to. And, and Tom has, is just blown it, man. Tom, Tom has dropped the ball. Okay. One of the greatest quarterbacks who have ever lived, but is he a great human being? 
I don't think so. And look, if you want to dive into a little, dive into a little deeper than that, the Black Lives Matter thing that he hasn't said one word about is a very alarming to me as a black woman. However, let's talk about Tom leaving his pregnant wife for Giselle, right? Yeah. So, yeah. oh, but Tom is such a great guy. Give me a fuck break. He can throw a football. He does it well. But is he humane? Does he have humanity through his blood? I don't think so. If I see I another video of him uh, talking shit to an opponent or him and Gronk in a, in a video, like hyping up the next game, like, man, God, it's so tone deaf. No, yeah. like, yeah. I'm not trying to co op shit, but I'm just like, I'm so yeah. fucking irritated every single time. Like, I see another video, like, at, at, like, at what point, how does he keep getting a pass? It's so fucking. He's annoying. the great white hope. He's the white guy. He's the white guy. If a listen, listen, when I hear, come on, man, give me a fucking shit. I'm like, how corny are you? That's what I'm thinking as a black woman. He gets a pass because he he talks his shit. He are, to me, he has no team spirit. But you know, he throws a good football. Got the memo. He can size up a defense in certain coverages. Good shit, Tom. What else are you good for? What else are you good for? So that's, yeah, that's I don't have that man. much respect for um for Tom. So so when I think about tomorrow's Super Bowl, I'm very conflicted because I obviously I love right. Coach Todd Bowles, right? I want him to win, but I'm like, but you guys got Tom Brady, damn it! <laughs> right. So I'm very conflicted. Um, I expect more from our athletes. Our athletes are people that are children admire and look up to and, asp and aspire to be. And if you're not using your powerful platforms to do good for the world and for humanity, I have a problem with that. So I can't call you the greatest because you exactly. dropped the ball on other things that are very important. Totally. So fuck annoying. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. <sighs> John, anything else before we get to th this or that? And we'll let no, I mean, I think the, the with Tom Brady, I mean, you know, something that he's gotten away with, he got to have his own entourage when he was with the Patriots. You know, he had to have his own T, he has his the TV 312. You know, the people with there, he's gotten, he has his own. I mean, he's gotten away with things that are outside of the team. He's never been a team guy in regards to it. Um, he also, if you look at Julian Edelman and others, he co ops other players to use his services. You know, they go rehabbing with his people. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a he's a money he's selfish as fuck. He's, he's a money selfish machine. As fuck. Yeah, John, but, but John, you said it. You said it all right there. You know, now mind you, let let let's talk about craft for a second. Oh, craft come on, like, please. Whatever, like right, right. Now, if let's let's <laughs> just say this. Let's say it was Hugh Jackson or Todd Bowles that got caught in the same predicament that Kraft did. Do you think they get a pass? Do you think no. it would be erased? No, no. It would not be right. No, they. So why they, they are there be... different standards? Yeah. Other... Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, we need right. Hey, yeah. Right. There's, there's, no, there's no two ways around it. I mean, it's you know, Pete, these guys and they're used to it. They've gotten a pass. They get a pass. Um, and it, you know, Kraft. I mean, here's the thing: you have an owner like Kraft who allows Tom Brady to run an enterprise within an enterprise, if you will. Yeah, and you know, yeah, and yeah. recruit, and he literally recruits other players to use his services, which he gets money out of. Yeah. Um, and then if they don't use his services, you think he's going to throw to them? You think he's not going to uh, tell the team, "Oh, I don't need." I mean, you know, you think Danny Amendola has a lot of say if he wants to go <laughs> use the? You know, Danny Amendola is like looking for his next check. I mean, and I, hey, look, he's great. He's had an amazing career for his size and his <laughs> stature and. You know, Danny Amendola started out in the practice squad of the Cowboys. If you watch, if yeah. you go back to uh, HBO's Hard Knocks, and he's had an amazing yeah. career. But Danny Amendola, if, if Tom Brady is expendable to the people like Kraft. Exactly, exactly. He's expendable. Like right. so many others are. If you don't follow my lead and what I want and need you to do, you can go away. So what right. are most people going to do? Most right. people, if you throw me in the woods, I'm going to survive. If I have to eat tree bark, I'm eating tree right. bark, right? So now take that on the football team and the NFL. They're going to, so, right. so th for the, the ones whole, well, the that whole, don't comply. Yeah, the, whole, 
Hootner and I talk about this all the time. The whole problem with the NFL, and when you get it down to it, the reason the owners have so much control is because the contracts are not guaranteed. Yeah. And the average fan doesn't understand the difference between the baseball. Trevor Bauer, who signs a four-year, a three-year, 140 or whatever it is. Yeah, he, yeah. He, he, get, he, he gets injured tomorrow. The Dodgers are on the hook for the whole 140. Yeah. You know, um, an NFL player, they'll give them the signing bonus in the one year, and then they're done. That's it. They're out. They're, they're gone. Right. And, they can, and then, right. And another team, knowing the market value has dropped, is not going to resign them for that rate. They're going to sign them for a minimum. But um, look, I, 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 I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. Uh, when in 2017, there, Trump was president. Okay. And Trump was having a meeting somewhere in New York City. It was a mandatory meeting for the players to attend. Now, let me tell you, like you already know, most NFL players are black men. Okay. Right. Do you think these black men, you might have had one there, maybe. Right. Okay. Right. But, and even he, even he might not have wanted to attend a Trump rally meeting, whatever right. it was called. It was a mandatory meeting. And for anyone that gave kickback, see ya. And I know a guy that was see ya because he talks about it. Gone. See ya. Adios. Right. So, I mean, you know, it's really, it's, it's really not a level playing field. You know, that's no. what's so scary about it all. But if you look at the WNBA, we've talked about this before on the show, 180 women came together and Warnock was polling at 9% when they started wearing the shirts to basically flip Kelly Loeffler. Yeah, yeah, Georgia, yeah. And so the WNBA of 180 women, and my point is, changed the whole election, along with Stacey Abrams and a lot of other people. But yeah, uh, the, the NFL players do not collectively uh, get together and say, we're going to uh, sit out. They're not allowed to. They're not allowed. Well, the WNBA they, weren't allowed to either, and the NBA, the NBA players oh, were not wait, allowed you know to, to. If you speak to NBA higher ups, owners, or league franchise, or, or, or the league franchise itself, the, the league, okay, they encourage their players That's true. to use their platform, and they will say it publicly and out loud. They will say it. Yeah, the right. NFL will never allow you to do that. So you now, can't tell me if these guys, if if fifteen hundred guys say "fuck this," and they they don't want to play, and they're done with this bullshit, that they they wouldn't they wouldn't it wouldn't impact things. You know what? They already lynched one guy. His name right. is Colin Kaepernick. They set the tone. They killed one black guy. I'm not going to be the next black guy they kill. Right, that's what I'm saying. That's the mentality. So you have to put pressure yeah. like Washington did on sponsors yeah. like FedEx. So you have yeah. to have right. You have to have pressure it takes from big sponsors. Big corporations to right. do that though. Is that's big right. corporate? That's, that's, that's big corp. You right. know, it's yeah. Fortune 100s right there. Yep. And so it doesn't uh, hit them in the pocketbook. The of that. Right. Totally. All right, we'll leave the floor for you. Let's get to the rapid fire. Um, because it's been amazing. I can't even believe the time has flown by like that. Um, John, anything else before we hit it? No, we touched on it. All right, Mary J. Blige or Whitney? <laughs> <laughs> Whitney pre-drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, <shit. laughs> Wait, did you give us a prediction for the Super Bowl? You said you're conflicted, but who are you picking? I, 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 uh, I... Um, you know what? If Brady wasn't with the Bucks, I'd be going for the no, Bucks. No, we're not doing this. Give us, give us the come on. I'm going Chiefs. I'm going wait, Chiefs. Wait, John, do you want to ask her the same question you asked Jennifer? Yes. Good. Down, so, down eight, this, though, John, not seven. I know. Down eight, right. six yard line, fourth down, up two just before the two minute warning. You got Aaron Rodgers. Are you going for the field goal? Or are you going for it? The touchdown. Oh, with Tom Brady uh, wait, on wait, the other wait, side. Wait, 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 wait. Repeat that again. Where am I? Where am I with this? Eight. You're on the eight yard line. You got eight yards to score. So it's fourth and goal. Uh -huh. Just before the two minute warning, you're down eight with Tom Brady on the other sideline. So if you kick the three and get it, you're still down five. What do you do? I'm going for it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm 
fucking going for it. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. You, you know why? Because that, that ain't that ain't Carson Wentz on the other side. On you. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you ain't getting the ball back. But I'm going for it. Yeah, I don't play small. We're going all in. I have to have confidence in my players, right? Exactly. And by the way, my players would already be practicing situations just like exactly. that. So exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, six minutes to go, maybe a different story, but not just not, <laughs> not on the other side of the two minute warning. Yeah, just, no, no. Man, no, no, no. All right. Waffles, pancakes or French toast? French toast. Wow. With challah? Uh, no. no, I just want oh. potato bread. I don't need that oh. whole, that, that thick ass bread. I'm trying to watch. Oh, you're, you're missing something. Kurt. You're, you're, don't be knocking the challah until you try it. No, I like it. Deal. It's just too it's damn thick. Deal. I no, like that's it. why you get all the you, you put all the egg in it, man. That, no, you haven't had no, man. No one hasn't made and then you look, and then it's, no. And, but John, no. but but John, then the shit comes soggy in the middle. If no, they don't do soggy. my shit no, well no. done, no, you're getting the hava from Stop and Shop. You need to go to a real. <laughs> you need to go to a real hava place. You're in New York, Coach. Come on, I'm disappointed. I'm just disappointed. I'm just saying. Whole Foods. Oh, give me a freaking break. No, that's some soft no. ass holla right there. That's no, no, no. Holla. I'm going to a diner. Hijack- Whole Foods has hijacked our holla. Let's just leave it there. You know yeah, I, I, hey, not mad at you, but guess what? When I make French toast at home, I'm using potato bread. It's my bread. I get it. Yeah, and I like that. Now, it's ask good. me about pastrami. Oh. I'm going to cats. Okay. <laughs> so, oh, there we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. You're right. Oh, sh- Whitney or Beyonce? <laughs> Whitney again? We're back on Whitney? Well, I mean... Listen. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> w- wow. Well, I said Whitney before pre-drugs, but Beyonce... <laughs> Beyonce all the way. Yeah, all Beyonce. Right. Yeah. Macaroni and cheese or pizza? Macaroni and cheese. Black people, baby. <laughs> you, oh, shit. Do you say mayonnaise or mayonnaise? Mayonnaise. Okay. You say neither or neither? Neither. Envelope or envelope? Envelope. Run DMC or LL Cool J? Oh, sh- I know both of those assholes. <laughs> um, I grew up with them, so I, I have to say, you know what? I got to go with LL because he's going to be in my documentary. So LL. Uh, sick. Yeah. When's that coming out? Soon. Well, sooner than later. Coronavirus shut that down for me, so yeah. Who picked that up? Oh, I got some people vying for it right now. So I've got... Oh. It's, yeah, that's awesome. I got it. Yeah. That's awesome. Can't oh. wait to see it. Yeah. Uh, Jay-Z or Eminem? Jay Z. Jay-Z. Hello. <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not going with the right guy who can rap. Give me a break. <laughs> not for not the not from the political side though. Okay. Denzel or Morgan Freeman? Oh, damn. Wasn't Morgan Freeman in Shawshank Redemption? Yep. Of course he was. Got yeah. To, gotta yeah. go, gotta go, Morgan, baby. Gotta yeah, go, Morgan. That, that's yeah. the deep breaker right there. I, but, but guess what? I'll give some to Denzel training camp days. He can have, he can come over to my place right now. Didn't you he see Philadelphia? Me. I did, yeah. Yeah, that I was did. a great movie. Blindside, yeah, yeah. Blindside or Remember the Titans? Damn, you guys are killing me. I don't choose between shit like that. Both <laughs> of them are extraordinary. Come on, man. Remember the Titans. All right. There you go. Dave Chappelle or Kevin Hart? Oh, shit. Dave Chappelle all the Thank way. You. Kevin, Thank you. I don't like Kevin Hart. I don't either. I don't okay. like his little two foot five ass. I don't like it. Yeah. I agree with you. God damn. Yeah, I'm not down with Kevin. Uh, Beastie Boys, Notorious B.I.G. Are okay, you serious? Popcorn or candy while watching a movie? Popcorn. Extra butter. Exactly. Yeah. And there you go, John. Online shopping or in person? In person, you gotta try shit on. You know? <laughs> Rugrats. I want immediate results. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Rugrats, Bugs Bunny, Tom and Jerry, or Scooby Doo. Tom and Jerry are violent. Like that's some. That's why people are incarcerated. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> in my opinion, there's a lot of people in prison that that are used to being getting their ass kicked on purpose. God, so, uh, yeah, anything but. You know what? I I go Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny. Best locker room pregame or postgame speech you ever heard? Mine. <laughs> oh, what, what did you say? What didn't I fuck say? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> wait, was it pre or post? It was pre. It was oh. pre. It was wait, what, pre. 
and then halftime. For the Half- Jets? Forget about uh, women's pro football. Oh, okay, women's gotcha. Football. Wait, so, did you yeah, ever so, did you ever get so mad with the Jets at halftime or yeah. or after the game that you you went off in the locker room? Yeah. Wow. I used to I used to be so angry that I went off before we got to the locker room, though. I mean, that's that's kind of the precursor I was for being a Jets say, coach, though, right. isn't it? I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean that team yeah, just makes John. you angry all the time. Were you look? You got you me the crying, coach? John. <laughs> We were, were you on the coach when you on the coaching staff when the last game of the year was Fitz, Fitz, Matt, Fitz Magic lost in Buffalo? I wasn't there, but okay. that was yeah, that was that was brutal. <sighs> yeah, I was I think I might be in prison right now. You talk about things in life. If they win that game and they go to the playoffs, Todd Bowles probably gets an extension. Seriously. Yeah, well, did you say probably? He would have. Yeah. Right. Right. He would have. Yeah. New York Knicks or the yeah. Brooklyn Nets? The Brooklyn Nets, baby. Right. Would you rather be a mind reader or have x-ray vision? Mind reader. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Uh, while walking, would you rather listen to podcasts, audiobooks, or music? Music. If you're in your car singing a song all by yourself, what song would it be? Mm. Um, it would be Etta James. Ooh, it would be some Etta James music. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. You it would be Etta me? James and Sam Cooke. Yeah. I just I just watched One Night in Miami. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. Wow, so good. Yeah. And American Skin too. Did you see that? I haven't seen American Skin. Oh, One God. Night in Miami. I watched. I was. It, it kind of dragged out, but yeah. the conversations amongst them totally. were phenomenal. Yeah, they were regular conversations, but with extraordinary things, right? So it was, totally. yeah, profound. Yeah, I really liked it too, yeah. Yeah, uh, put your seatbelt on when you watch American Skin, especially the end. Yeah. It's really, really hard to watch. Uh, the beach or hiking? The beach. Laundry or dishes? Should I like doing both? Um, They're both therapeutic? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they are. They make me feel good. Most important in a partner, intelligence or humor? Intelligence. Wow, really? That surprises me with you. And Because I'm the funny bitch, right? You got to <laughs> at least bring something to the table. <laughs> Pen or pencil? Pen. Board games, cards, or puzzles? Puzzles. Interesting. A different world or family matters? A different world. Come on, HBCUs, baby. I know. Yeah. All right. Good times or Sanford and Son? Good times. Wow. What's happening in the Jeffersons? The Jeffersons, because my dad looks like a (laughs) light-skinned version of George Washington. (laughs) Oh, shit. (laughs) My dad, my father hates when I call him George. My dad's name (laughs) is Wendell, but he looks like, he looks like, uh, he looks like the guy George. Uh, and he has that walk. He's that short dude with loose hair. <laughs> oh my god! And he's always in a goddamn rush. And whenever I want to piss my dad off, I call him George, and he gets really <laughs> angry. So get yeah, a Jefferson. <laughs> oh man, dodgeball or tag? Dodgeball. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you have this is the last question. Okay. So you have so you're the commissioner of the WNFL, and you have an assistant to the commissioner position available to you do you hire john or me <laughs> you're an ass <laughs> you're such an ass <laughs> um wow well you know what two-part answer because john's been kind of quiet if i want my way 100 percent, i'm going with john okay <laughs> okay i'm going with john but if i want if i want some if i'm really busy and i need someone to speak up i'm going with you so you um go. yeah mm-hmm. so Man, awesome. Well, <laughs> hey, uh, I don't know if you can love somebody when you just met them, but I, I just love you. Like uh, you're infectious among everything else that you're doing for, you know, women, black and brown women for there's there's boys that I'm sure that look up to you, too. Like there's just little kids just in general that look up to you. Women, um, you know, I'm sure they look at you as their light. And uh, it's it's been like totally amazing sharing space with you. Is there anything else you want to share? We've been in 17 countries. We, we started this talking shit about sports and it's turned into equality and, you know, keeping this conversation going and, and meeting people like you. It's, it's, uh, it's really, it's really an honor besides your 
groundbreaking, you know, uh, titles that you've had, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot more than that. And use, using your platform to do what you're doing now is just an inspiration. Uh, thank you. I, I, I have definitely found my purpose and I'm, I'm very happy with my life today. I'm, I'm very happy that I'm making a difference. And uh, yeah, I just want to continue to make more differences in people's lives for the better. Yeah. Game one next year, who will be under who will be under center for the New York Jets as quarterback? Who will be under center? Oh, yep. I don't fuck, fuck with offense like that. So that's a question <laughs> that I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to answer. Yeah. You think like, uh, you I think the Jets will go after Watson? Is my question. Deshaun Watson. Well, they, you know what? They should. They should. I mean, listen. At this point. The Jets should be going for you and Michael. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, I got a gun. Let's fucking go. <laughs> my poor babies. I tell them all the time. My poor babies. You know what? When I was coaching the Jets, Kamal Adams was was my was one of my players. Yeah. When I when I worked there, and yeah. Coach Bowles would always say to me, "Hey, Coach, can you settle his ass down a little bit?" <laughs> and I would look at Coach Bowles and I would say, "I already did." <laughs> and he was like, damn, you know, but the, but here's the crazy part is that we love that kind of enthusiasm. Gamal Adams plays with passion. He right. just loves the sport. Right. You want players like that. But then you have to, you do have to put some blinders on him because I'm like, dude, do your assignment. Don't worry about his assignment. Right. Do your, if everybody knew and executed their assignment for the play, we would win every goddamn you know what, play. You know what Bill Parcells' motto is? Don't be the guy to f it up. <laughs> That's literally Bill Parcells' oh. motto. So so Bill Parcells, I got stories of Bill, about Bill Parcells. <laughs> so a lot of my friends are Jets players. From Curtis Martin to Fred yeah. Baxter to Eric Green to Bobby Hamilton to Bobby, I, I mean, a lot of my boys are Jets players. When Parcells came to the Jets back in the day, Fred Baxter, and I'm going to call him, he's probably going to curse me out, but I don't give a shit. Um, Fred Baxter <laughs> said to me, oh, all the guys are mad because Parcells is coming and he don't take shit. And I said, well, that's fucked up. Don't they want to be a, a, a winning team? Right. And he said, exactly, Colette. So I said, so you guys are just truly losers, huh? All the way around, huh? With the exception of one or two guys, mm -hmm. but you want to you want to play under a coach that authentically and innately wants the best for you to put you in winning positions, oh. and for any player that wants to slack but still get the W, you can't give fifty percent and act like you're a hundred. You're not. Exactly. I need a hundred percent. Parcells brings it. I like his fat ass. I like it. I like it. <laughs> What other what what else about the NFL surprised you um, that that you didn't really you know that you learned that's that you carry with you today as we as we put this thing to bed? That women women work harder. Really, women work harder. So when I my my first time going to a practice NFL practice, I thought I was going to have an aha moment, like I'm going to learn so much. I'm going to see things I've never seen before. And when I got there, I was kind of a little bit let down. I was mm -hmm. let down. So um, yeah, that's an aha moment for me. But then, but then you see like Demario Davis. Demario Davis, he was he was our, one of our linebackers. He would be on the field, Michael, before practice and after practice. Wow. So and then after practice was over, he would always call me over. Hey, coach, can you do me some passing some passing drills? Wow. Some DB drills, and this is why he is an Acme player. He's a leader. You know, he's a force to be reckoned with because you give 100%. You got to put it in. You got to yeah. put your time in to make it worth your while. So I respect I, I respect guys like Kamal Adams, Demario Davis, yep. even Leonard, Leonard Williams. Mm -hmm. There was a guy on the, uh, there was a, I was in Detroit. This is, this is fucked up, but it is what it is. <laughs> I was in Detroit. <laughs> And oh, it was shit. a away game preseason. And I walked on the field because I was ready. I had all my coaching stuff on. I was ready before all the guys were and the coaches. 
So I'm walking on the field and I'm thinking to myself, this is my first away game as a Jets coach. And wow. I want to take it all in. I walked through the tunnel. There were five white men and one black woman that worked for the Lions. I don't know in what capacity. I come out the tunnel, the black woman looks at me and she's like, <laughs> thumbs up. And, yeah. and then I nodded her like, yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, girl. Right? And then as I walk by, the guys go, who is she? The black woman says, she's the coach for the Jets. So the guys now, one of the guys said, eh, she's probably a cheerleader. Wow. Yeah. So wow. now he said it so I can hear because I wasn't that far away. Oh, right? hell no. So now imagine me walking and I'm walking. I heard it. I was like, ah! and I just stopped. <laughs> Uh-uh, hell no. I stopped and my back is to them and I heard somebody go, oh, sh she stopped. Uh-oh, she's turning around. She's coming back. And I came back and I spoke to the guys and I said, hi, my name is Colette, Coach Colette. What's your name? Ask me what, the, give me a million dollars for me to tell you what their names are. I don't fucking know because they don't matter to me. <laughs> Right? right. So, so then I said, I'm not a fucking cheerleader, but it's nice to meet you. Have a good day. Nice. And the only reason why I didn't <laughs> somebody up was because I worked for the Jets and I had to right. represent right. that organization. You know what I mean? But wow. you'd be surprised at the, at the backlash that we women get, you know? So, oh, yeah. but yeah. Oh, oh, so, so Leonard Williams now, so Leonard, here's Leonard Williams. Um, I go back in. The guy now apologizes to me. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. And I, I ignore him. I come out now with the team pre-game warmups. Leonard Williams and I are running back in together. And the guy says to me, I'm so sorry, I really am sorry. So Leonard Williams says to me, yo coach, what's that about? I said, nothing, ain't nothing. He goes, you sure? <laughs> but as but as Leonard Williams started talking, we're both looking directly at the guy as we're jogging. So we don't take our eyes off him, but he was ready to f him up. You know what I mean? I love it. I love it. In Detroit, too. That's perfect. Way In to Detroit, way, yeah. What a way to end things. All yeah, right. Man. Hey, much love. All right. And uh, appreciate you spending a lot of time with us after a long day. And enjoy the Super Bowl tomorrow. Absolutely. You too, guys. You anything, too. Anything we Take can care. do down the road, please let us know, and uh, I'll definitely stay in touch. You got it. Sounds right, much good. Much love. Mad respect. All right. All right. Take, Take care, John. See you soon. All you right. too. Thanks, Colette. All right. Bye. Appreciate you. All right. Bye. All right. Thanks, man. She was great. Wow. Yeah, she was. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks, brother. Late. Thanks to Colette Smith, the first African-American woman coach in the NFL for joining us here in the Sports Deli. Remember, please mask up. Black Lives Matter. Peace.